Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramhamsa Paribhajakacharya Stotra Sata Sri Srimad His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Istkan Founder Acharya Sridhar Prabhupada Ki Namacharya Sridhar Haridas Thakur Ki Param Sukhahal Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktivendra Ki Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopi Gopi Nath Shamakunda Radha Kunda Gidi Govardhan Ki Vrindavan Dham Ki Mayapur Dham Ki Jagannath Swami Ki Yamuna Mai Ki Ganga Mai Ki Tosi Devi Ki Bhakti Devi Ki Samaveda Bhakta Vrinda Ki Gaur Primanandi Hari Hari Bo all glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thanks to Ram Rai and his company. Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Kuravani Pacharane Nirvishesha Sanyavadi Paschata De Chitarane going to be talking about and reading from books <coughs> I have written about Sri the Prabhupada. The most important book is the Sri the Prabhupada Lilamrita. This is the authorized biography of Srila Prabhupada. And has been translated into many languages. And I felt I was empowered while I was writing this. It wasn't done just by me alone. There was a big team of devotees, interviewers, researchers, typists, devotees who made the chronology of Prabhupada's life, etc., etc. After writing Prabhupada Lamrita, I was still on a roll of writing about Prabhupada. So I wrote more books about him. In fact, I wrote 16 books. And today, eight of those books which have long been out of print, 
have been reprinted and I have them here today to distribute. The first book I wrote after Srila Prabhupada Lilamita was Prabhupada Meditations. Dhanadhar Swami has written in his Monday greetings about his process of writing and he mentioned that he has epiphanies or moments of inspiration which guide him in his process. So Prabhupada meditations similarly is made up of epiphanies, of remembrance of Prabhupada. I tried to meditate and remember, especially <coughs> the earliest memories of Prabhupada. I'm going to read from this book. <coughs> Swamiji has really gone deeply into my life. An early example of an intense Prabhupada meditation occurred to me after I had met Srita Prabhupada for only a few weeks. With his permission, I paid a visit to my parents at their summer bungalow in Avalon, New Jersey. I arrived at their home in the evening and went immediately for a swim in the canal in their backyard. As I floated in the water and looked up at the stars, I was overwhelmed with the presence of Prabhupada. Hearing his voice and the things he said, which he had been teaching us, after us being associated with him day after day, I felt it coming through me, all the Prabhupada expressions. There I was in the water looking up at the sky, which was so very far away, and without calling for it, I was surcharged with remembering Prabhupada. I understood. Swamiji has really gone deeply into my life, and it's very strong. I have told this story before, and I've written about it. There is no harm in the repetition, provided each time you remember, you do it by going to a genuine source of feeling and thought. So I want to open these canned memories and seize them as they actually occurred. To do it, one has to enter an altered state of consciousness. When Maitreya asked Uddhava to speak about Krishna, or when Parikshit asked Sukadeva, it was not canned. Rather, Uddhava and Sukadeva felt such ecstasy by thinking about Krishna that they could not speak. And then I quote Bhagavatam, third canto. On the inquiry by Vidura about Krishna, Uddhava appeared to be awakened from slumber. He appeared to regret that he had forgotten the lotus feet of the Lord and remembered all his transcendental loving service unto him. And by doing so, he felt the same ecstasy that he used to feel 
in the presence of the Lord. Because the Lord is absolute, there is no difference between his remembrance and his personal presence. Therefore, Uddhava remained completely silent for a moment. But then he appeared to be going deeper and deeper into ecstasy. I used to have recall sessions with Baladev helping me. In one session I started from my 1966 apartment at First Street and took the short walk over to 26 Second Avenue. Baladev was going to steer me into the hallway to go up and see Swamiji in his apartment. But I suddenly wanted to go directly into the storefront and attend the temple meeting. Thinking of the kirtans with his one-headed drum, that's really the heart of association with Swamiji. His playing his drum and we start playing the cartels. It's really nice, the making of spiritual music together, especially when you feel part of the group. Swamiji is singing the kirtan. First he sings some prayers and you just go with it and listen. It's not only sound, but the total kirtan, watching him and trying to get the bliss. When Swamiji sings and you all sing together and your voices are merged, it's musical and spiritual, but it's a kind of crying too. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Hare. You start in. This is going to go for half an hour. He goes back and forward. He sings and then you sing. Swamiji is completely into it. He loves what he's doing, chanting Hare Krishna. After a while, the dancing started. Maybe a Chutananda or Jodorani, Kirtananda, Brahmananda, and I would get up too. The dancing was walking in a circle or standing in your place and moving your feet. The circle goes slowly around in front of Swamiji on a dais. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Hare. He keeps his eyes closed and sometimes they open and he sees what's going on. He looks around at the people and then he closes his eyes again. After the kirtan, there would be waves of quieting down and the devotees would be smiling to other. Wow, that was far out, man. Boy, I really got off on that one. <laughs> Then there would be calming down, getting your seat, getting ready to hear Prabhupada talk. Swamiji was getting himself ready. He had his pocket watch and he put that in its place, getting his book ready and maybe he'd say, Raymond, fix its light or get water. While everyone's rustling and trying to calm down. One wants to be with Swamiji again in those kirtans if it can be done, it will act as a vital tonic. The presence of the Guru. Don't deride the love which Prabhupada encouraged us to feel in the kirtans. Now, decades later, don't patronize. We were hippies, you know. 
and Prabhupada was permissive. He encouraged ecstasy in the kirtans, and he led us to believe that we actually loved the Lord. But since then, we've discovered that we don't love Lord Krishna so easily. It may be said that I've underlooked, overlooked a great secret. It was easy to love Lord Krishna when Srila Prabhupada was leading you in kirtan, and that's still available. Meditate on being in kirtan with him as you go about your routine du duties on his behalf. Prabhupada Meditations was first published <coughs> in four separate volumes. They've since gone out of print. Now they've been reprinted by my book production team in four books. This is volume one and volume two. And it mostly concentrates on the very earliest memories of Prabhupada on the Lower East Side. Yeah. And here's the second volume which comprises volumes three and four. I want to be in his presence. Swamiji is behind the tin trunk. Over his head is the calendar picture of Krishna playing the flute, standing on the earth globe. We are lounged and bunched around the wall asking questions. What happens after death? What kind of person does Krishna want me to be? When we see a picture of Krishna, is that the artist's conception of how he looks? Is cosmic consciousness the same as Krishna consciousness? Is this the same thing that Krishna, that Christ and Buddha taught? Swamiji was happy after a year, lonely year uptown. He took his time and answered our questions. He said, it is such a nice thing. Srila Prabhupada taught us the importance of the spiritual master. No one can understand Krishna except through the spiritual master. However, he never said, I am that pure devotee. I am the spiritual master. If somebody asked him bluntly, he replied, that you can judge for yourself. Yet he preached that we must surrender to the spiritual master. When Allen Ginsberg met Prabhupada, he suspected that they were both exchanging false egos. He thought, oh, he is trying to sell himself as the guru. He wants to submit to him. So Ginsberg resisted it. Some of us did not resist. We wanted the guru and we accepted him. We wanted a loving exchange with Krishna. We kept coming back night after night, morning after morning. Why are they after me? Prabhupada asked later. I am just an Indian. I have no money. I never bribed them. One night when it was time to leave, but none of us wanted to go, 
He laughed and said, All right, you can go home now. The store will be open at six in the morning. He was the store, the storehouse of nectar. His hours were from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. He saw that we were after him, and he was after us to bring us to Krishna. Then I have a piece of writing called the red beads. These are the beads he chanted on in 1966. We used to wear them around our necks in two strands. Put back. Open at that place, the red beads. Last, put last posted. Although Swamiji had a bead bag, he often chanted his beads by holding them in two hands. The boys followed this method, and even when they were not chanting, we would wear the beads around our necks in a double strand. Swamiji thought this was acceptable. He told us either to keep them in a bead bag or wear them around our necks. And you can take them on the street like this if you're not ashamed. <laughs> Soon after Prabhupada's arrival on 2nd Avenue, young men started appearing in public. Young men and women, not so many women, with bright red beads in their necks. In those days, devotees did not wear dhotis or tilak or shaved heads. So the main way that you could spot a devotee was by his red beads. With Gargamoni, it was his Shakespearean locks and his red beads. We thought wearing the beads was cool and their clicking noise and red shine. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We learned to finger the beads by watching Swamiji. You fingered with your right hand and held the other half of the strand in your left hand. As you moved each bead through the right hand, you moved the strand through the left hand and gradually pass the circle around your neck. It involved more touch and sight than when the beads were kept in the bead bag. Besides, bead bags hadn't yet arrived. One day I was going to visit the welfare clients on Canal Street, and I chanted as I walked. I began to feel uneasy that my chanting was like not being counted in any way. I wanted to capture it and get credit for it. As soon as I saw Swamiji, I told him, my chanting is just going to the wind. He instructed me to buy little beads to use as counters. When I returned with the beads, he says, you are very prompt. Then he showed me how to use the counters. He said that Vaishnavas in India keep individual quotas for japa. Some have a thousand beads on one circular strand, and they chant one round a day. When he held initiations, that was a good chance for us to watch him chant. He gave instructions about chanting on our beads at that time. He told us to chant by starting on the bead next to the head bead. Chant the Hare Krishna mantra on each bead by using the thumb and third finger. Don't touch the finger, don't touch the beads with the pointing finger. Go around once, and when you reach the summit bead, then don't cross over, but start back in the other direction. 
One of the best times to chant was in the morning with Swamiji. After Kirtan, he used to say, John, one round. We did it together. He usually finished before we did, and then we all trailed off, even if we hadn't finished the round. In my apartment, chanting privately, I sensed the luxury that Japa afforded. I owned no comfortable furniture, no rug, television, or air conditioning. Yet I felt luxury by fingering the bees. I imagined sages in India as described in the Bhagavatam. As they were chanting, so was I. Devotees wrote poems about chanting and published them in Back to Godhead. Ray Rama published a poem, Red Cherries. He compared the wooden beads to cherries. The cherries that grow on bushes pale, fade, just as the patterns of flowers fade in an oriental rug. However, the cherries of devotion, the holy names are everlasting. My beads, however, have faded over the decades. They're hardly red, but I still chant on them. I also chant on Tulsi beads. A popular book I wrote about Prabhupada is Prabhupada Nectar. We didn't have to republish it because we had many of them in stock. This consists of interviews with many devotees about Prabhupada, not just myself. And it's still a popular book in ISKCON. I won't read an excerpt from here. Life with the Perfect Master, a personal servant's account. This is a reprint. Tells of the seven months when Prabhupada called me to be his servant in 1974. I had to learn how to be his cook as well as type his correspondence and massage him. <clears throat> Learning how to cook was difficult to cook in his three-tiered burner. It was time to prepare Prabhupada's lunch. He was sitting outside on a narrow veranda in his gumsha, waiting his massage. First I brought out the cut up loki squash for his where we had a larger stove and four burners so we could cook sabjis in different pots and pans. But making pot chapatis was a problem. Without an open flame, the chapatis would burn and not puff up. 
Panditji came to help me, but he was so exasperated by the electric range that he went to Sri the Prabhupada and told them we were having difficulty making chapatis without a flame. Prabhupada said that we should keep trying, but bring in the prasadam on time. Then Panditji got a brilliant idea. Using a flat metal strainer, he was able to place the chapatis very close to the red hot electric coil, making them blow up into perfect balls. We excitedly pre finished preparing the meal and brought it to Sri the Prabhupada, who put, sat in his chair beside the Formaka table. Prabhupada preferred to eat in private, but from within the kitchen, Pandaji and I were able to watch, unnoticed, peering through the slots in the wooden shutters, separating the rooms. We anxiously watched as Prabhupada mixed together the rice, dal, and sabji, and began eating a piece of chapati in his right hand. Look, he's taking lots of dal, I whispered happy to see that his appetite for one of my preparations. My squash didn't seem to interest him. <laughs> Chapati, Prabhupada called out. And Pandaji rushed in with another of his expertly puffed up chapati, serving it hot onto Prabhupada's plate with a pair of tongs. Judging from Prabhupada's hearty eating, the first lunch in Hawaii was an improvement. And I grew more confident of my cooking. Then in Hong Kong, on last morning in Hong Kong, which was particularly cold, Prabhupada asked me to stay back from the morning walk and make some halava for his breakfast. As usual, the sincere Chinese men were going on the walk and so there would be good Krishna conscious questions and answers. I would have liked to have gone walking with Prabhupada up that Chinese peak. But Burijan and his wife were also going along, so Prabhupada had plenty of company. Staying back to cook was my duty. As usual, I had to hustle up the ingredients, this time from the hotel restaurant. They gave me enough butter and grains for one portion. For an hour, I worked carefully. I knew what I wanted, a thick, buttery, hot halava, the grains slightly dark. Prabhupada and the devotees came back just as I was finishing. They looked uncomfortable from the cold. a perfect occasion for Kalava. Prabhupada sat for breakfast and I put a large bowl of the rich halava before him. After about 10 minutes, he rang the bell. I entered the room and began cleaning his eating area. He had eaten almost the whole bowl full. I was already feeling blissful when he asked, who has made this halava? I did, I replied. It is very good, Prabhupada said, and without looking at me, he went into the bathroom to wash his mouth. There was always something special about pleasing Prabhupada by cooking. And this time in particular, I had carefully prepared him a bowl of halava, that's all. But my satisfaction upon hearing his words of appreciation was so deep that it vanquished all my anxiety and unhappiness. There is nothing as rewarding as pleasing the spiritual master. Here's a book I wrote 
for what we call the centennial year. Prabhupada was born in 1896 and in 1996 was the hundredth anniversary of his birth. So ISKCON made a big fanfare about 1996. A hundred this, a hundred that, a hundred this, a hundred that. Books distributed, a hundred preparations for Prabhupada's prasadam, and so on. I made a little contribution to the fanfare by composing in a couple of years 100 Prabhupada poems. And they announced it one day in Mayapur, along with the other 100s, that I had written a book, 100 poems. a sepia picture of Prabhupada in his kitchen at Radha Damodar. We imagine how it was before he came to America. The light is coming in the window from Rupa Goswami Samadhi. Prabhupada said he was comfortable in those two rooms, living in Vrindavan with no cares. But Krishna dictated, come out. So he went to America to give us Krishna consciousness. Then back to Vrindavan to build a beautiful mandir and guest house and establish the spirit of worship and service. In this photo, he has returned to Vrindavan. He's sitting on a straw mat on the floor. You may remember that picture. It's one of my favorites, Parapad sitting in his kitchen in the Radhadamadar temple looking out the lattice window. His hand is grasping the prasadam from his plate. He is wearing a sweater and staring intently out the window, which is flooded with light. What is he thinking? What new order is coming from his gurus who live in their samadhis and bhajan kutirs? Where shall Prabhupada go next to perform what task? Maybe he is telling them, although I made some success in America, only a few came, and time will tell whether they succumb again to sex and drugs. Quote, no, you did right. You established the seed and plant of bhakti in the West and gave new birth for India too. There is always more to do. Lord Chaitanya wants this. Of course, this is only my daydream of Prabhupada's thoughts and the replies of the Goswamis of Vrindavan. It's my way of looking into his room where he is absorbed in ecstasy and I'm hoping to grab a little mercy to carry on my service. I exchanged many letters with Prabhupada. Only Brahmananda got more letters than I did. So I wrote books, my letters from Srila Prabhupada. I wrote three collections. I printed his letters and I printed my comments on them. In the first volume, there's a combination of memoir without letters, because that was in 1966, and we didn't have to write letters to Prabhupada because he was with us. So part of the memoirs is this. Srila Prabhupada gradually attracted me 
especially by his personal dealings. I would deliberately cultivate these dealings with him. Once at one of our evening meetings, a crazy Puerto Rican entered the temple and danced around in a mad, non-devotional manner. Prabhupada tolerated him and he eventually left the storefront. A day later when I was walking in the Lower East Side neighborhood to the welfare office, I saw the same man. He was now standing in the middle of the street with a broom, imitating a traffic policeman by dramatically conducting traffic. I went to Prabhupada's apartment and told him, Swamiji, you know that man who was dancing wildly in our kirtan? I just saw him on the street and he was directing traffic. At first Prabhupada questioned me by what I meant by directing traffic. And I told him that the man was crazily imitating a policeman. Oh, is he a madman? Prabhupada asked. I would purposely try to bring up odd topics like this because I delighted in hearing Prabhupada talk about seemingly ordinary things. I had quickly learned to hold him in high reverence, but hearing him comment about ordinary affairs made me feel more love and friendship for him. Our developing relationship was a mixture of absolute philosophy and personal affection with a firm basis of love and trust. Prabhupada had said, unless we were acquainted with Krishna, how could we love him? The same seemed true of our relationship with Prabhupada. This is volume one called With Prabhupada in the Early Days. Here's volume two. It's called My Letters from Srila Prabhupada. You cannot leave Boston. I was the temple president of Boston from 1967 to about 1970 or 71. On the cover there's a picture of Prabhupada looking out at the Commonwealth Pier in Boston where the Jaladuta first landed. There's a letter from November 1969 from London to Boston. My dear Sasarupa, please accept my blessings. I can understand that the composing program is not going as planned. Therefore, I think Palika Dasi may immediately be trained to help with this task. For layout work, I have already sent Aravinda to come to Boston to do that work. And he goes on telling how to organize the press. This was a handwritten letter. This letter is entirely about press business. Prabhupada states that the composing program is not going as planned. ISKCON Press had a compositor, a glorified typewriter to justify columns and set type. Not every typist knew how to use that machine. It took some training and understanding of compositing. The compositor had to do a lot of calculations in her head. She would type a line and the machine would type out plus four or plus six 
to indicate how many spaces short of full justification the line was. The devotee then had to calculate how to fit the words in on each line to justify the type properly. It was slow, neat work. This is an interesting aspect of Prabhupada's personality that he was interested in state-of-the-art equipment for book production. When he heard that IBM was giving away free compositors to schools, he asked me to go and see if we could qualify as an educational institution. He was certainly willing to use whatever was necessary to produce his books. He didn't hesitate to use anything simply because he was a renounced Sadhu. Later it was different. Here we see him reading leaflets on compositors. But when he visited the BBT in Los Angeles in 1975, he was more like an author going to see his book trust without much technical knowledge of the equipment being used. By then his disciples were taking care of that aspect of the press. He sat at Radhabalava's desk while Radhabalava showed him the production charge, which defined the various stages of production. Prabhupada said, when I see a chart like that, it makes it more complicated for me to understand. It is always interesting to note how Prabhupada did whatever had to be done. And when it wasn't necessary for him to do any more, because his disciples were trained, he no longer pursued his interests. This is a letter when ISKCON Press was in Boston and there were 60 devotees there. This is a book I wrote more recently called Srila Prabhupada Smaranam. It consists of many colored photos and reflections on the photos. This is a picture of Prabhupada in Boston. We sit or kneel and look reverently to our spiritual master. This was Boston in 1971. We believe everything he says. We do whatever he asks. He knows he has us under his control. We are young disciples in awe of Prabhupada. He takes the responsibility of guiding our lives. He has taken our karma. He is grateful that we are submissive but he wants us to be much more competent and organized and preach more efficiently in Krishna consciousness. We are passive and await his commands. We have shaven our heads and we wear Vaishnava clothes. We have given up our American identities, but we are still very much American. He knows we are trying our best, and yet we are not capable of much. We can chant on our beads, but it is difficult to control the mind. We don't know the esoteric truths of Krishna consciousness. We chant loudly on the streets of Boston, and he is very proud of us for that. 
We are learning how to distribute Back to Godhead magazines for 25 cents. But we haven't learned yet how to sell his big books. He is patiently waiting for us to do more. He loves us and we love him. We are at a sweet early point in our relationship. It is growing to where we will be able to take on more responsibilities. And he is grateful for what we are doing now. Here's a picture of a notice that Prabhupada hand wrote and taped to the wall in 26 Second Avenue. He put it up there in November of 1966. It says, notice, all initiated devotees must attain morning and evening classes. I don't think we actually had evening classes. Must not be addicted to any kind of intoxicants including coffee, tea, and cigarettes. They are forbidden to have illicit sex connection. Must be strictly vegetarian. Shouldn't extensively mix with non-devotee. Should not eat foodstuffs cooked by non-devotee. Should not waste time in idle talks, nor engage himself in frivolous sports. Should always chant and sing the Lord's holy names. Prabhupada's English handwriting is clearly legible. Why did he wait so long in the year, November 25, to post the rules for initiated disciples? Maybe he saw we were getting slack. He just wanted to make it official. At the first initiated in the summer, the commitments were hardly unknown and not committed to by the initiates. They didn't all know they were pledging to follow for a lifetime. Some of the restrictions seemed hard to follow at first. Years of smoking cigarettes and taking drugs and being habituated to sex had to be given up. These were deeply ingrained, but the taste of chanting the Maha Mantra and the taking wholeheartedly to hearing from the Swami and honoring Prasadam with him were enough to give up the old sins and sins. Prabhupada was one of the few yogis or gurus in the West who made these demands. Swami, you are very conservative, Allen Ginsberg had said to Prabhupada. But Prabhupada had no intentions of giving up the regular principles. Quote, the notice, unquote, was a historical document taped to the wall in the storefront without fanfare or announcement. We read it and gasped and said, this is serious and I accept it. A picture of Prabhupada playing the gong. Sri the Prabhupada, you are playing the gong. It has a high, tinny sound, not as melodious as the cartels, but it crashes loudly for the leading of the entire Kirtan group. Prabhupada played it with a steady rhythm. The wooden mallet strokes resounded on the lower part of the gong and made it heard throughout the hall. Prabhupada leads to the kirtan of Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabihari. He refreshes our memory to the time when Sukadeva Goswami spoke to Maharaj Parikshit when the king had only seven days to live. The king had insulted the yogi and his son cursed the king that he should die in seven days. Prabhupada leads the singing and then gives the lecture. He speaks on all the sections of the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is in Vrindavan, where Prabhupada said was his residence. It is Vrindavan where he lived after he took sannyas 
in the early years and where he printed the first three volumes of the first canto. He withdraws within himself and meditates on Radha and Krishna as he sings, Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabihari. And he lectures on all the sections of the Srimad Bhagavatam, leading and singing in Vrindavan is special. But he is universal and carries this mood with him wherever he goes. He is the founder Acharya of Iskhan. He plays the gun. That's all the books I'm going to read from. Now I want to invite you to go and look at the books. I'm going to ask Baladev to make an announcement inviting you.